My name is Angela Rhinus. I'm the Discipleship Coordinator here at Harbor Covenant. It is my joy to get to be with you today. Well, I wanted to just begin by introducing myself a little bit. Um, I wanted to start by telling you that I am a thrifty person, okay? I am a thrifty person. Now, some of you might refer to that as a tightwad, all right? So some of you already are thinking like, oh, I like Angela because I'm also a thrifty person. And some of you are already up in your head thinking like, oh my gosh, not a tightwad, right? So, so even when we have descriptors about people, we start to kind of go places in our head, right? Well, today we are going to be talking about the, the reality that God calls us to love all kinds of people and to lay aside some of those judgments that we have um, for the sake of his mercy. So um, a little bit about myself in terms of my thrifty nature. Well, I come by it quite naturally. I come from a, a long line of tightwads. Um, my, my grandma, who grew up in the Depression, um, I have two really strong memories of her house. Uh, the first strong memory, which was like a very modest brick house built in the 50s um, in kind of a middle-class neighborhood, um, was under her bed, she had this cardboard box full of wrapping paper. And what you need to know about this cardboard box full of wrapping paper is that it was not new wrapping paper, okay? This was wrapping paper from, I'm pretty sure, the 50s and 60s and 70s. Okay, not, this was during the 80s, right? So this was not new wrapping paper. And it was, had crease lines on it. So obviously it had been used before, okay? So and a lot of it was really nice. Like it was really pretty. But she would, you know, save all of the wrapping paper and fold it and put it under her bed, right? It was, it was a reusable thing, you know? Nowadays, we throw it away, right? It was reusable. The other, the other strong memory I have of my grandma, and of course I have lots of lovely memories as well, but um, is that she had this dishwasher in her kitchen and it was disconnected from a water line, okay? So it was not a dishwasher anymore and it was full of Tupperware, also known as cottage cheese containers. <laughs> okay, so... The woman I don't think owned any like real Tupperware like we might use today. She only exclusively used like yogurt containers and cottage cheese containers because she was thrifty, right? So this was the foundation um, of my childhood. And I could also like wax and wane about things from my childhood that my parents have done and still continue to do. Um, but I just want you to take away that I am a thrifty person and I come by it naturally. Well, one of the ways that I am thrifty is I love to save money when I go grocery shopping, okay? So I'm kind of a grocery nerd. I love to go grocery shopping. I like to like save a buck when I go grocery shopping. And about a year ago, um, Matt, my husband Matt and I realized that our pretty much favorite grocery store, other than Grocery Outlet, was being built on 6th Avenue in Tacoma. And so if you're not familiar, it is Winco Foods. Okay, Winco Foods is the ultimate tightwad place to grocery shop. They have an excellent bulk section, including bulk spices. Okay, little shout out to Winco. If you need some, if you need some cumin, you know where to go. And Matt and I started going pretty regularly to this Winco once they opened. And part of the reason they did is my daughter plays volleyball just kind of down the street. So we're like, oh, well, we're already paying the toll. Tightwad alert. We're going to go to Winco and also like save money in the bulk and, you know, all the food. So for about a year now, we've been going pretty religiously to this Winco. Sometimes Matt goes during volleyball. Sometimes I go. Um, but this has kind of served to play two purposes in my life, going to Winco on a weekly basis. The first, of course, is to save money, right? First and foremost. But the other purpose that Winco has served in my life this last year is it has grounded me in the reality that I live in Gig Harbor and Winco is not in Gig Harbor. Okay, so I just like to point out that from where I live, which is off of Reed Drive, Winco is 10 minutes from my house. Costco is also 10 minutes from my house. All right, so I live sort of in the middle. But when I go to Costco, I feel like I am in Gig Harbor because I am. When I go to Winco, I feel like I am not in Gig Harbor. And it is very good for my soul to be reminded 
that there are a lot of people in the world, dare I say the vast, vast majority, that are not like me. And so when I first started doing this, true confession, I was pretty judgmental. That I would look around and it's, it's just really easy to be judgmental of people that are different than you, right? That buy different food than you, that, that act different than you, that talk different than you, maybe you don't understand them, yada, yada. Um, one of the things that was hardest for me was seeing all the little tiny kids that were grocery shopping at like nine o'clock at night. You know, I'm thinking, why, why aren't they in bed? And then it hit me. Oh, it's because their parents are probably working 12-hour shifts, and that's the time that their family can actually go grocery shopping, right? So it's just constantly kind of like pushing me outside of my box a little bit. Well, this summer, we are in the book of James, and the book of James is constantly pushing us outside of our box a little bit and sometimes a lot, right? That is the goal of the book of James. It's practical and it's pushing us. So I love this quote from the Bible Project video that kind of does a recap of the book of James. And this is what they say. They say, the book of James is a beautifully crafted punch in the gut. Okay, a beautifully crafted punch in the gut. James gets into your business and challenges you how to live. Okay, that's what James is about. Well, I wanted to just, just briefly share a little bit about James because I think it helps provide the context of the passage today. Um, James is widely believed to be the half-brother of Jesus. Um, at some point, he went from a skeptic to a believer to a leader. And um, at this point in the letter, he is a leader, perhaps the main leader um, of the Church of Jerusalem, which is the mother church, the original church. And during this 20-year period where James is, is, is writing right now, um, it's important to know that the area was really impacted by famine, and there was a lot of widespread poverty. Um, and it's also important to know, I think, that the Messianic Jews are also the Jews who followed Jesus, and were really being persecuted a lot by prominent Jews, so people who, who were Jews but were not following Jesus, that there was a lot of persecution happening in that environment. So that's the backdrop um, of the book of James. Well, we know that James, if he was the brother of Jesus, he would have literally grown up with him. And so we see a lot of echoes in the book of James having to do with the book of Matthew, which was also written to a Jewish audience. Um, and there's also a lot from the wisdom letters, the book of Proverbs, which would have been very Jewish. Well, James contains three main themes. Um, chapter two, which is where we're going to be today, unpacks the third theme. And you will see this throughout the summer. This is definitely a theme the theme of wealth and poverty, okay, the theme of wealth and poverty. So James is writing here to his fellow believers. They are in a difficult situation, and the church would have been primarily composed mostly of poor people, but there certainly would have been some prominent benefactors in the congregation. And it's important for us to know going into this chapter today that the environment would have been that the rich were oppressing the poor, that often the rich owned these kind of rickety high-rise apartment buildings that would collapse. They were very unsafe, very precarious for the poor people. It's also important for us to know that rich people would have been giving, would have been common practice for them to give big gifts that were about honor, right? So you can kind of think that the modern day equivalent is like if you go to university, <laughs> right? Big buildings are named after people. That was a practice back then too. All right, join with me now. We're going to be chapter two, verse one. Um, this is what I call the thesis statement of this passage. Okay, so my fourth grade son has, has been learning about thesis statements and main points this year in school. This is the thesis statement. So join with me now. I'm going to be reading from the NIV. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Okay, I'm going to read it again because this is the thesis statement, and I want you just to sit with it for a minute. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. All right, so this is the direction that James is going. This is indeed that kick in the gut, right? This is, this is he's calling us out. He's saying, do not show favoritism. And what I love about this thesis statement is he crafts it around the character of Jesus Christ, 
he says, why are you to not play favorites? Because you are to look at your glorious Lord Jesus. And that word glorious points to a perfection. That Jesus is perfect. That the way that he moves in the world is perfect. And that we are also to display that perfection by not playing favorites. Well, so James then takes us on a journey of, of a little story to kind of illustrate this thesis statement. And then, he, and then he makes some theological points after that. So join with me in verse 2 here. Here's the story. And I want, as I read this, I want you just to visualize this in your mind. Sort of put yourself in this position. The context is they would have been in a gathering, like a church gathering. So verse 2. Suppose a man comes to you in your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. And a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you. But say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Okay, so a couple things that I want to point out here. Uh, first of all, the gold ring is a sign of wealth and also power. Okay, wealth and also power. And what we see here is somebody who clearly is known in the community, who has wealth and power, and somebody who probably, like, literally smells, okay, coming into the congregation. Like, that's the word. Somebody who's stinky and smelly coming to the congregation. And what you see is that these two people are both in this story treated as a commodity, okay? The rich person is treated as a commodity of, I'm going to elevate you in hopes that you'll do something for me or do something for the congregation. And the poor person is disposed of and literally put at the floor or at the footstool next to all the stinky feet, right? That they are discarded and, and put way down out of the way in the back where nobody can see them, right? So this is, this is the picture. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that in both of these situations, they are a self-serving act, right? That you're either elevating somebody for your own gain or you're discarding somebody because they're not helping you or maybe they're even embarrassing you, right? In this situation. But I'd like to point out the last verse because this is something I think that is relevant to where James is going. He says, verse four, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. Okay, so the root of this plain favorites, of this making somebody a commodity, starts in the mind. It starts with how they're thinking, that they are judging people, and that's coming from an evil place, and we're seeing that play out in the way that they act. All right, I'm going to move on a little bit to talk about why James makes this argument, or how he makes this argument, of what does it look like for us, for us to extend mercy and to not play favorites? So the number one reason, which is in verse 5, is he says, or he writes about how God is on the side of the poor and on the side of those who are looked down upon. Okay, so I'm going to read this verse 5, and you'll see this. Verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. Okay, well, this is the verse that I think I'm going to talk the most about for this little chunk because I have wrestled with this, friends, this week, that there's this reality that, yes, God doesn't play favorites. He loves everybody. He's, he's calling everybody unto himself. But then we also just have to take a moment and sit with the reality that all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, God calls to the poor, right? That he is offering his love and his salvation. But there is something about the poor that is special in God's eyes. And I love that word chosen because it literally means drawing or going after somebody, that there is a special way that God draws or goes after people that do not have privilege. And I did a little research just because I want to kind of ground us in reality. The reality is that 712 million people right now today are living in extreme poverty. 
Okay, extreme poverty. Not poverty, extreme poverty. 712 million people right now in the world. Okay, so I'm just naming that because I think we live in a fairly bubble area, right? It's good for us to be, remember that this is not normal, right? That the world that we live in is big. It's big, and there's a lot of people that are going through extremely hard things, and God is chasing after them, right? That he has an inheritance, a, kingdomly inher- a kingdom inheritance planned for them and for those who love him. All right, we're going to move on. We're going to talk about the rich persecuting the poor, poor Christians, number two. The rich are persecuting the poor Christians. So this is really here about dishonor. Verse 6. But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to who you belong? Well, so this is a practical reference to what was going on in the society which was rich Jewish people were bringing into court um, poor converts, poor Christians, um, persecuting them for their faith. And that, in this context, uh, the, the poor Christians had no leg to stand on. They had no money. They had no power. They were often given harsher penalties, right? So there's a practical thing happening here. Um, but the, the verse that stood out to me was this very first verse that talks about um, dishonor, but you have dishonored the poor. And... The, one of the words that I looked up about that was actually insult, okay, that you were insulting the poor. By raising up the rich who are tearing down the poor, you were actually insulting your brothers and sisters and those coming into your space that love the Lord and that are poor. And I think we need to consider that, that as we elevate the rich, there's something that happens that the poor are insulted by our choices, especially the rich who who are coming about it in wrong ways. Okay, we're going to move to number three, where James talks about how this violates the law, the royal law of love, the royal law of love. Okay, join with me here in verse eight. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law of lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. So what what James is pointing out here is he's calling us to an awareness of what the purpose of the law is and to the higher law of the kingdom of God, right? So these are Jewish believers. They would have been familiar with the whole law, but he is specifically talking about the royal law. Don't you guys like that word royal, the royal law? And I think there's two things that he's pointing to here. One, he's pointing to the splendor. Like when we think of royalty, we think of splendor. Um, But he's also pointing to the reality that we are in a kingdom and that we are led by a king and his name is King Jesus, right? And the number one royal law of King Jesus is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these, right? But prior to that is love the Lord your God. So this is the, this is the summary of the law is to love and the royal law is to love your neighbor as yourself. And this comes straight from King Jesus, who is teaching us how to live in his kingdom. Well, the kingdom of King Jesus is full of upside-down values, right? Where the poor are elevated um, and the rich are to serve them, right? There's all sorts of things in the kingdom of God that are upside-down. And James is talking about that. Well, I think one of the things that he's addressing here, too, is this sort of fixation that we have. Um, And I see it here in the Western church, too. We, turn, we, tend, we tend to have kind of a fixation on what I would describe as the big sins, okay? So like murder and adultery are the two that are named here. Um, but what James is calling attention to is that when we break any part of the law, that we are under the judgment of God, right? And that one of the laws um, that, that God provides is, is working for the poor. And that's specifically played out in loving your neighbor as yourself, 
So I love this quote from Augustine. I think it kind of sums up what James is getting at here. Augustine writes, the whole law hangs on the love of God and that every transgression is a breach of love. Okay, so every transgression, every time that we break God's perfect law, um, it's a breach. It's a breach of, of his love. And so as we move into the world as plain favorites and not showing mercy, um, we are breaching that law of love that God has given us. All right, lastly, number four, James talks about how there are consequences for how we treat people. Okay, there are consequences for how we treat people. Verse 12, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay, mercy triumphs over judgment. And I think what James is getting at here is twofold. One is that our words and our actions, which stem from our thoughts, that those things really matter. That God is holding us accountable and that they really matter. And that he's also alluding to the fact that there will be a day of judgment where we will be held accountable at the throne of God of our thoughts and our words and our actions. And that it is really through the mercy of Christ that we are given the power to overcome those things, right? That at Calvary, God's mercy triumphed over judgment. And that's the power that we have to change, friends. That that's the good news. That's the hope. That we will be judged for our thoughts and our words and our actions. But it is through mercy triumphing over judgment at the cross that we are given that power to have changed lives and to extend mercy to other people. Well, as, um, as I end today with sort of the scripture part, I had some just practical things that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, the first thing that I wanted to share just in terms of practical is I've been thinking a lot about, and I've already talked about this some, but how the basis for plain favorites or this stuff kind of playing out in our communities and our lives is so related to how we think about people and what our first impressions are, and the things that go through our mind. And I think we, we have a lot of biases that we aren't even aware of sometimes. And one of the best ways to evaluate how biased you are is just to kind of pay attention when you're around people that are different than you. What is going through your mind, right? Where, what are you thinking about? And so my first encouragement for you today is that you would go out in the next week and that you would go out into the community somewhere um, where you can be around people that are different than you. And I would just encourage you to just sort of pay attention to what you're thinking, okay? And where the places of bias or judgment are for you with those people that are maybe like you or maybe different than you. And just to ask God to help you view people as he does, as image bearers, as people that are made in the image of God. And my, my second piece of encouragement for you with that is that maybe you could start small, like go to Fred Meyer and get Carver, right? Um, and I actually did this a couple days ago. I like paid attention to what I was thinking about people and get Carver because I knew I was going to talk about this. And even that was an eye opener for me, for myself. Um, but my second part is I would encourage you to build something into your life where you are going out of your way to be observing and interacting people with people that are different than you to kind of level up, right? In terms of evaluating where you're at in your heart and your thoughts. And I'm not saying this because I'm saying to you, oh, you should go serve all the, all the people that you interact with in that store. Okay, sure, I hope, you're, I hope you're kind. But really what I'm hoping is that you will use that as an opportunity to evaluate where your heart is and what you're thinking about other people in the world because that is the basis for mercy, right? That is the basis for leveling up to being in the world where God calls us to be. Okay, the second thing that um, I want to just encourage us to is after we sort of work through ourselves, um, is to, to be thinking about what are ways that you could partner in the world um, with organizations or with people that have already been doing this for a while, right? I'm not, 
I'm not calling you to go start your own new thing. Sometimes I feel like that's even a little bit destructive, right? The best thing to do, in my view, is to partner with people that have already been on the journey of trying to figure out some of this stuff. And you might not be aware of this, but here at Harbor Covenant, we actually have a number of really awesome ministries that we partner with. Um, these are fantastic organizations that have really thoughtfully considered um, how, how do we serve people in our greater community and in our world. And I'm not going to name, there's several of them, I'm not going to name them all off, but if you would like to take that next step, I would just encourage you to go online. Um, our website has a list, kind of describes them. We have people in our congregation that can kind of get you more information about that. I'd love to help you with that if you need help with that. Um, and part of that is I want to give a little shout out, a little save the date um, for something that we do here at Harbor Covenant called Compassion, Mercy, Justice Sunday. Okay, so usually we call it CMJ Sunday because, you know, Compassion, Mercy, Justice is like a whole sentence. Um, so CMJ Sunday is the 25th of August. Save the date. Um, that is the Sunday where our whole church goes out and serves the community. Okay, we do some in Tacoma. We do some in the KP. We do some here in Gig Harbor. Um, but we do projects to bless and serve the community. It's a great way to get to know other people in the church. And it's a great way to just, in a small way, be part of something cool and something bigger that's happening in the world. So save the date for August 21st. First. All right, friends. Well, as we, um, as we leave here today, I just wanted to read a little story to you um, for the road. And I love stories. This is from a book by Robert Lupton. It's a little old. Um, so I did change some of the words to make it a little bit less old. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you. And I just hope that as we, as we move on today that this will resonate with you. So she's 66 twice a great-grandmother and a devoted member of our church. She lives in an overcrowded, dilapidated house, but her spirit is buoyant. You're my buddy, she says to me with a broad, snaggletooth grin. I pray for you every day. And then she gives me a long bear hug, and she wants to sit close next to me in every church service, even though she smells of stale sweat and urine. It does make me feel both a little nauseated and a little special. Her internal plumbing doesn't work as well as it used to, and she leaves tobacco smear smears when she kisses my cheek. But I am pleased to have her by my side. Often she hints, sometimes blatantly, that she would like to come home with us for a visit. Nothing would delight her more than for us to have her at Sunday dinner at our house. But there is a conflict. It has to do with values that I learned from childhood. I believe in good stewardship and that it means taking care of my belongings, treating them with respect. When I invite Mrs. Smith into our home, we will have filth and stench soil our couch, and there will be stubborn offensive orders in our living room. My greatest fear is that she will want to sit in my new corduroy recliner. I wouldn't want to be rude and cover it with the plastic to cover it from urine stains, but I know that it would never be the same again. Unknowingly, Mrs. Smith is forcing a conflict, a clashing of values upon me. Preserve and maintain, conserve and protect. These are the words of, of an ethic that has served me well, but over time, it is subtly filtered into my theology. Why should it be such a struggle to decide which is more godly, to welcome Mrs. Smith into my home and my corduroy recliner, or to preserve the homey aroma of my sanctuary? We did finally inv invite Mrs. Smith to have Sunday dinner in our home, and she did just what I feared. She went straight for my corduroy recliner, and it never has been the same. In fact, Mrs. Smith even joined a Bible study in our home the next week. Every, Sunday, or every Wednesday evening, she headed right to my chair. She even referred to it as her chair. I thank God for Mrs. Smith and the conflict that she brings, and her more clearly in Sunday school lessons or sermons, I encounter the Christ of Scripture saying, insomuch as you have done it to the least of these brethren, you have done it unto me. Thanks be to God. All right, friends, we're going to close with three questions for you to ponder. Number one, how are you tempted to play favorites? Number two, how has the mercy of God changed your life? And lastly, where can you serve the poor or stand with those that are?
Hi, thanks for watching. The people of Harbor Covenant Church really want you to know the love that God has for you, want to grow with you in faith, and want to serve alongside you, not only to help others do the same, but also to make our families and our communities better. If that sounds like something that you can get on board with, then like, follow, and drop us a comment in the video. Watch some more videos on our channel or come visit us on Sunday. You can find out more about Harbor Covenant Church at harborcove.church.